Are we good? Phones on. All right, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order, and we'll just go ahead and do roll call real quick. Diane? Cheryl Adamson. Here. Jeffrey Clark. Here. Sam Hightower. Here. Mark McCoy. Here. Cheryl MacArthur. Here. Darcy Here. 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 I heard you. <laughs> Thank you. Denise Rasek. Here. Judy Warren. Here. Mitch Quick. Here. So the uh, one item and only item that we have today is consideration of a conditional use permit for the property south of uh, KDOT to operate as a uh, slaughterhouse. We're going to have Ali start with the discussion. Yes, I will just start really quickly by saying this, uh, this property just south of KDOT is the property that is proposed for development of the meat process. Oh, I'm not turned on. Thank you. Uh, for development of the meat processing facility. The parcel is already zoned properly as an industrial two, uh, heavy industrial. So they are just seeking a conditional use permit for, uh, per our guide, zoning guidelines, that conditional use for, permit is for uh, stockyards and slaughterhouses. And I do have presentations. One of them is by Jody Hayner. The other is by John George. Do you all care who goes first? And here is the photo for that, and let me just get it up on the screen for you. Is it the other one? The other one? Yes, okay. the other one. I did bring it was just a second. Of information for you guys. So if you want to take one, you can pass them around. Thank you. I'm Jody Hayner with Bourbon County Economic Development. Uh, thank you today for coming together to consider the uh, proposal for a conditional use permit for the micro meat processing plant. I have here with me Billy Madison, owner of W, -M w Diamond M Meats. I don't know why I always say it. <laughs> I'll wait till they get the slides on the screen and I'll, then I'll move forward. Okay. All right. So the first thing that uh, we wanted to, to uh, share with you is to give, uh, have Billy give some history about his um, his education and experience in meat processing and uh, his expertise that he has in, in the field, just so that you guys are comfortable knowing that Billy actually does know a lot what he's doing and is consulted in many of these plants for his expert advice. So, Billy. Thank you for having me here today and, and looking at our project we have here. Number one, I grew up in this town. Went to high school here, went to community college here, went on to get my education at K-State um, in meat science. Uh, started a small mom and pop butcher shop. We've accept, we've kind of accelerated into just a little bigger <clears throat> to where we need to be. Uh, we can grow a little bit. Um, and when we thought of expanding, because in our current location, we can't, because we're in the city of Spring Hill and we have houses on both sides of us. Uh, this was the first town I thought of to bring the project to, uh, not only because of we have nine and Kurt employees that are from Fort Scott, um, but uh, it's always an honor to come back to where you started at. And... Uh, That'd be, that'd be really good. So, um, but anyway, the reason uh, we've got to this point is just, you know, I got lucky and um, have been involved in some big meat projects that uh, I've consulted uh, plants in Fort Worth and Fremont, Nebraska and other places with my expertise in the uh, harvest process of cattle and hogs. And, uh, we uh, pretty much, we just 
when those big plants have issues inside the plant, they'll call me. And I'll go in just because of my years of expertise in, in the harvest process. Um, one of our bigger ones we've done was in Fort Worth, and it's actually a plant in the city of Fort Worth. It's downtown almost. It's about two blocks north of the, the uh, main stockyards. And uh, I helped them get a project going with hogs that are going over to Belgium that are taking away the feral hog population. And so they had a hard time figuring out how to scald these hogs and make it work because their hair is so thick. And, and in a couple of days' time, I got it figured out, and now we export a lot of feral hogs to Belgium, which is great for the farmers in Texas because those things are a real nuisance animal. So anyway, I've had a lot of knowledge in the bigger plants and smaller plants and medium plants. I've kind of been in them all. Plus, I own my own. And so, uh, this project will be great for this community. It's going to add add jobs and a lot more jobs over the years. Uh, it's a job that can be taught. You don't have to come in with a college education. You can start at the bottom and get all the way to twenty five bucks an hour if you you want to have the skills to be a good butcher. So uh, that's pretty much all I got. So if we go on to slide two, uh, when the, this first came to us, I reached out to the K-State Extension Office to see, to, you know, just to look at the needs and, and what kind of, does it turn off automatically for some reason? No, I'm talking about the clicker. Oh, oh sorry, I have the clicker right here. Oh, okay, okay. We make it super difficult. <laughs> So, so one of the things that we we all right. So one of the things that we did want to look at is you know what we have in the area and and to see if if this is going to you know impact negatively impact any of the other um, meat lockers that we have here. Uh, Bronson would be this the thing that would be closest in comparison, but that is a, more of a state level where this is inspected by FSIS. And that means that you can ship your products across state lines. You can sell across, across state lines. So from an economic development standpoint, that means that we're getting outside money into the community. Another big difference between Bronson and this project is that uh, in Bronson, farmers and ranchers can take their product, their hogs or their, or their uh, cattle or whatever, and they, they pay a processing fee and then they can get their product back, they can get their, their beef back or their pork back. With this um, market, with this type of development, you would take, the rancher or farmer would take their, their hog or, or whatever they have to the processing plant, and that actually goes to market. You, won't, you wouldn't get that product back to you. So a little bit of a difference there. So it, what's highly recommended by the K-State Extension Office is to fit our local needs here. So moving on to the next slide, slide three. The project, like Allie had talked about, is going to be south of the KDOT site, which is technically right outside of the Bedco uh, Industrial Park, actually, but it is still zoned for heavy industrial. The um, plan is for about 500 head a day. The reason why they've been able to stay at such a small capacity is because they found a niche market. They're able to utilize almost every single aspect of the animal and sell it. The construction costs are gonna be about $2.7 million with a building of about 17,500 square foot. The uh, acreage that we're looking at for this proposal is on privately owned land by KW Land Properties. And Billy is relocating here from Spring Hill, which is located in Johnson Hill, or Johnson Hill, Johnson County, uh, because his, the main reason he's chosen our community is because a lot of his workforce comes from his community and drives north anyway. So moving on to the next slide there. Like I mentioned, the workforce is mostly from here, but we'll actually be able to increase the number of jobs. 
One of the things that's very important to Billy is that he's a good neighbor, conscientious neighbor. He makes sure that the plant itself is very aesthetically pleasing, that, uh, that when people you know, look at it, they're not gonna be able to tell that it's immediately a meat processing plant or anything like that. It's going to be another industrial use for uh, the zoning that is, that is there currently. With this amount of property, it will give the owners room to grow the plan is in about three years to grow to, uh, to beef. Right now, when you look at the food systems aspect of, of hogs or beef or what have you, there are, there are several farmers in our community that are hog farmers. Uh, we can, it's, it's, you know, unarguably beef is, is by far a larger market. But so why is that? Is because there isn't an opportunity, an end use for your project product if you're a pork or a hog farmer? Because there isn't, you know, here we have a great system for beef. We have an end use with the farmer's market or, um, you know, the, the meat locker or what have you. But with hogs, they're really the only end use you have for it is if you sell it at the county fair. And there's nothing wrong with that. But um, this would definitely allow for additional use and room to grow for those. When we first proposed this project to Bedco, uh, we worked with the Kansas Health Institute and did a what's called a health and all policies approach. Oh, sorry, next slide. We took a health and all policies approach and made sure that we did and we investigated any of the social, environmental, or economic conditions that this project could potentially impact. This is the checklist of the things that we considered. Uh, odor isn't typically on that list, but uh, you know, <laughs> I don't. I can't imagine what your first reaction was to this project because when I first got the phone call about taking on this project, I was like, oh, "We just got over windmills. We really have to take this one." So I was really very nervous, and so, but and so about uh, about the odor, about what kind of an impact this would have to our community, and the more I learned about it. And, and I even drove up to Spring Hill to the plant and walked around outside and, and got letters of support from residential neighbors right across the street and commercial neighbors that are just downwind and really learned that what my perception was, was not an accurate perception of what this facility is. So I move on to the next phase, page slide here. Air and quality was a big one on the checklist here. Uh, you know, there's going to, Billy went back and forth on whether, you know, we're going to do lagoon or septic or city water because, uh, you know, just those different things on what they're going to consider. So we went and talked to the city water department, uh, Michael Mix and the city engineer. And we talked about the state of the art equipment that uh, Billy has in his current facility and that will be, you know, put in the new facility. It's called a dissolved air flotation um, system and it will gather what's called the bio it's measured through biochemical oxygen demand and it gathers the total suspended solids now that was a mouthful for a social worker here so I so it's a very good thing because when you think about our community's water system or wastewater system you don't want it to be a burden or cause any type of a um, and a higher percentage of what's called those VODs. So the, num the amount of water that will be used by the facility and the amount of wastewater that will be taken back will not uh, have any impact. The city engineer even said, are you sure you can't use any more? Because there is, everything is used so much, even with that water, that wastewater, a lot of it can be reused at, to a certain extent because it's cleaned so finely and they sell that product that they clean from it. It's what is used for your makeup. Mm -hmm. So they, they even sell that, that total suspended solids that they get out of the water. So when we talk about every single thing that could be sold off of this animal, it, we're not kidding, right? Another thing that um, we wanted to make sure is clear is that there's no on-site cooking of awful. And that's how you say awful. And that's, the, that's what causes a huge smell, plug your nose, that type of thing. And so there's not going to be anything like that that's going to be. So we move on to the next slide. 
overwhelming or offensive odor is something that is, um, we really, really had to take into consideration. We are an agricultural community. Uh, so we have to take that into consideration too on, you know, somebody who might not be used to the smell of cattle or something, uh, you know, what kind of perception is that going to have? Uh, being from a city myself, I don't, I didn't, when I walked, when it was up there at the site, I did not have any sense of an overwhelming or any offensive odor unless I stood right next door to the outdoor pens that were there. And there was. But this new site isn't going to have outdoor pens, and so they won't have that ability to have that, that smell. Prevention is really key to mit mitigating any uh, offensive odor. Bacteria is what creates bad odor. So there is actually regulations in place that require a US or a F USDA inspector actually has an office in the plant uh, so when he's building his building, he has to plan for the USDA inspector's office and his own shower. So that that is part of the building plans. And they can't operate unless that inspector is present. In addition, they have three to four other inspectors that are their boss's boss to the boss's boss that are just drop in to inspect every month. This is a very highly regulated field because... It's a food that we consume and it has a lot of uh, issues, especially, you know, hogs, they have to make sure that they um, arrive in, 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 num in this bulk number and then they have to clean after every single one of them. Uh, so daily update onto the next slide. There's no outdoor holding pens. And so again, there's not gonna be any issue with smell outdoors. And then uh, the next slide, is the Peoria Processing Center, and it processes about a thousand heads daily. And I'll let um, Billy talk some more about um, this and how it's a little more similar to what he's planning on building here. Just half the capacity. It's pretty simple to see by the pictures. This plant runs a thousand head a day, and it's been in operation for three years. If you look at the concrete floors, they look brand new. And, and it's all on how you build it, which that's why we're using John as our engineer, because John's very thorough in his knowledge of USDA meat plants and has worked with several guys in the larger capacities of building these plants. And so everything's top notch, all the way from the, the, the drains in the floor. I don't know if you can see a floor drain there, but you notice it's not no pot metal. It's nothing else. It's stainless steel. No, and that's what that creates is so that bacteria, bacteria can grow on, you know, your normal floor drain and things like that. Stainless steel has, it can't conduct to it and grow bacteria like it does on other metals that has little holes in it and everything else. So that's why everything down to the to the floor drains is thought of in these plants. And so, and then you go up and you notice how the, the uh, concrete has diamonds in it. Well, that's for sure footing for everything because we go under humane handling audits. And, and not only, and the reason we're gonna add value to our farmer's products around here is because we're gonna be not only USDA inspected, we're gonna be SQF certified. So SQF certification opens you up to selling meats to Whole Foods, Sprouts, places like that that are looking for a niche product that are grown by a local farmer that somebody can actually come in contact with. So if somebody in Overland Park at Whole Foods wants to buy a pork chop and they see on there, it's made by Mr. Smith's farm and comes through Bourbon County pork processors, they can come down and they can see everything. This whole system is becoming transparent into our food system. And this is where we're going in the future of meat processing is, is this stuff is what's going to be available to people because we have to have the consumer's confidence that we're putting a product out that they can feed to their child. And it's, and people, you know, it used to be a half percent population want this, but more and more and more people are wanting to know where their food comes from. So, why shouldn't 
our Bourbon County farmers to be at the front line. And, and that's the opportunity this plant has given us is our Bourbon County farmers, because of me being from here and just being lucky enough to be involved, that I'm going to be able to do this for my family members and other family members that are friends with them. It's a real honor. And so these plants are built this way. The, the, the odor and everything else is the last thing we're worried about because we have a lot more issues that we need to take care of to be SQF certified. So odor, if you have an odor problem, you're already got a problem. You're, you're out. You know, if you're worried about your last dollar in your checking account and you owe a hundred, you're already way past. So, so the things in these processes, everything in these plants are, it, it is not the old way. It's, it's a whole new thing. Well, and speaking and, about that too, you know, when you're uh, talking about regulations that are in place right now, this isn't just Billy's plant that gets regulated like this. This is every single plant that's going to operate has these regulations in place. So whether Billy's operating it or somebody else is operating it, these pl these things are in place at the federal level for this. Same things that Bronson has to go through as well on having their inspections. And that's why they can be located right in the middle of downtown Bronson without having any, any issue otherwise, right? The next slide. The next slide just shows that uh, more of the Peoria um, plant. And then on that bottom right, you can see that the Peoria plant, which is in Chicago, is actually... Um, just adjacent to a residential neighborhood with houses right across the street. Next slide. Another issue that we looked at is crime and government spending. And we, through our research, have found that there is no uh, systematic effect on, in, in the industry on either crime rates or local government spending. Next slide. We reached out to industrial park uh, members and business owners who have voiced support for the project. It was originally planned to be directly north of Al Nice's uh, plant there, Nice Products, and it uh, and he was he is very supportive of the, this uh, project. Recently, Frank Halsey has been publicly supportive of it with Mid um, Mid Continental. Uh, so, so there has been a lot of support from the industrial park from this project who will be neighbors. Again, this is zoned industrial. Um, there's, uh, you know, employment growth, growth is something that we really have to consider too when we're looking at these different facilities. This is a different, this isn't a meat packing plant. This is a meat processing plant. So meat packing plant has shown a negative wage growth, whereas meat processing industry has seen a positive employment growth effects. And like what uh, Billy was talking about as well, this is all part of our food system. And as we move further uh, down the road here, these, these systems are becoming more regionalized. And so uh, when I go to economic development events or talk to my peers, they all want something like this and that they are very, we are very fortunate to have something like this come to our community. And like I said, this is something that could be supplemental income for other um, family farms. And it's also a stimulus for um, you know, other sectors for retail trade and services. Next slide. This just kind of talks about higher use of, of land. Um, having the, this underdeveloped land is, is something that is so exciting that we have to offer for a business wanting to come in and put a $2.7 million development on. It provides high value in terms of property, uh, property tax value, in terms of jobs and employment growth. This, uh, there is certainly, certainly a, a place and good use of land um, in certain areas for baseball stadiums and, and four leaf clovers uh, stadiums and things like that. But when you compare the two on having the value of use of land, this certainly 
is a higher use, a higher value use. When we consider the different aspects of, of using the land, you think about is it physically possible? Is it legally permitted and zoned appropriately? Is it financially feasible? And are we maximizing the productive use of land? I believe with this project, we absolutely are on each one of those um, bullets pending the approval of the conditional use permit. Next slide. So how does this impact our taxes, right? Can we move to the next? Okay. So the value, uh, the, the value right now of the land um, that's privately owned is about $120,000. Uh, with a $2.7 million plant, the assessed value of that is going to be $705,000. That's with the plant on it. The tax area is 76, which is taxed at a 1.161902 mills, and that is equal to $114,141 estimated in total annual rep revenue from this construction. And of course, that gets divvied out to the city of Fort Scott, the county, your school district, and, and, those, and the community college and that kind of thing. So next slide. The, the incentives available are the, that we have offered and have been able to seek out and, uh, and connect. The Neighborhood Revitalization Program is an incentive program available to anybody in Bourbon County for residential or commercial. So if you look at the NRP program that, uh, that the business will take advantage of, even after that, uh, even after that 10 years of rebate is complete, we're still going to be um, looking at $91,313 in property tax. That's with a 2% depreciation each year. The Economic Development Rider Program is something that we've been able to connect Billy with through Evergy, and he will have a discounted rate of energy over five years on energy consumption. And finally, my recommendation is that we offer approval to the conditional use permit. Is there any questions you have for Billy or I on this presentation? I think we probably will have, but okay. uh, we'll go ahead and finish with the rest of the presentation. Yeah, please don't go ahead. <laughs> so John George Thank you uh, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm John George with Agricultural Engineering out at Uniontown and uh, similar story to Billy's uh, educated locally I live on the family farm today I've operated my business professionally from the family farm for 50 years, more or less. And uh, I was literally the first university trained environmental engineer in American world agriculture. That's another way to say that manure is my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I started that career really early, crawling around in the chicken yard in diapers. But I went to school at K-State in ag environment, manure management, environmental protection. First became an issue of interest brought up. And the feedlot industry was morphing whole you know, lock, stock, and barrel from the mud of the corn belt to the drier, more productive, irrigated climate of the high plains. And that was great concern to you know, many people across the country. So I was recruited out of college as one of the first people to do research on manure management and the interactions between manure and soil to develop the first short course in the world on ag pollution control by the National Environmental uh, Training Center. And two years in, the Clean Water Act was passed. And I immediately had responsibility for developing the permitting program for feedlots of all sizes, whether they be beef, dairy, poultry, swine, etc. 
And in that time, I figured out that <clears throat> this old country kid had no business living in big cities. I like places like Uniontown, Fort Scott. And the other was that American and World Ag producers, in the worst way, needed somebody that could help them maneuver the burgeoning regulations and requirements and technological challenges, etc. <clears throat> so I launched out to consult to anybody who needed help. And in the ensuing 46 years, we've served over 7,000 projects in 40 states and 15 foreign countries. And relative to this project, one of my greatest achievements is what we call flush systems that allow routine automatic cleaning of livestock facilities. <clears throat> And I'm pretty sure there's nobody in here who doesn't have a flush toilet. And what a flush toilet does is removes waste from your living quarters completely, out of sight, out of mind, down the sewer to the leach field or to the sanitary sewer and the city's treatment works. Well, I designed and patented flush toilets for livestock buildings 40 years ago. And they've been, we were the world leaders. And virtually every land grant university that has an animal facility, a research lab, wanted our flush systems because <clears throat> you understand the importance of aesthetics and good environment for students and the patrons of universities. And I've got a few slides here. Yep, that, uh, they're up and we're ready for you. <clears throat> the, Billy, the first one you've already pretty well seen, but that's the aerial photo of the site with K dot there at the top of the picture. So, next slide. <clears throat> this is the footprint of the proposed plant imposed on the site and 800 feet from 69 highway right away. It'll be visible, but it won't be right against the highway. There's a lot of land there, a lot of space. Next slide. <clears throat> You've already seen the renderings. Uh, this is one looking over the plant towards the highway. And the next slide is looking over the plant towards the east. So, next slide. This is the detailed footprint of the plant. Of the plant. That uh, Billy has hired some plant specialists to help put this together, and we'll help implement it on site as far as foundations and drainage and parking, uh, traffic flow, product flow, utilities, etc. Next slide, please heard some anxiety about, oh my God, a slaughter plant, a, a harvest plant. Once a, once a facility, it's always going to be one. This happens to be the Jimmy Dean processing plant in Newburn, Tennessee. Very attractive, very aesthetically acceptable. And the next slide is a receiving pen at the end of the work shift. It's been washed, it's clean, it's virtually odor free. Next slide. This happens to be the Tyson uh, plant at uh, Waterloo, Iowa that processes 19,000 head of hogs a day. And one of my clients was refurbishing the animal barn and uh, which would had been built 40 years ago without what we would call quiet, you know, insightful quality design. And the roof was literally corroding off of it. Next slide. We refurbished it all <clears throat> and converted it to a well ventilating facility. And this is what we call the inlet curtains that on the one side when it's hot, we can open them up and flush the air 
one full air change a minute over the hogs and people. When it's cold, we can close that down and move only enough air to remove the moisture and respiratory byproducts. Next slide. And this is just the exhaust fan side, the ventilation side, where all you see are some fans and part of them are actually covered up because there's a work area there that uh, having the high velocity air blow over the what's going on with people working uh, be a little objectionable. So that's basically the slides I have. And so other than that, just here if you have technical questions about the environmental side, be happy to try to address them. We will uh, continue with Jody here too. Uh, you'll, stick around, you'll stick around for questions. Sure. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I don't have to keep anywhere. <laughs> and it's a whole 15 miles square. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chairman, did you want to go into public comment or did you want to hear from city staff? Yeah, I think that would probably be uh, good. Let's hear from the uh, public and then we'll, we'll go into your part to uh, kind of wrap things up along with Rachel as well. So. We do have three people down here on the uh, on the list that would like to speak. I do have some written questions that I'll answer whenever we get into some questioning on there. But the first person listed is Steve Berge. Steve here. Well, I'm definitely in support of the project. I met with him at the very beginning when I was still Golden Bitco. Uh, he's very sharp. He knows the business. The main thing I wanted to impress is how it's going to affect the farmers in the area. Uh, the banks and everybody know how difficult agriculture is now because of prices and so forth. A lot of farmers are really struggling. And to me, this will allow a revitalization of swine in this whole area. And uh, hog farming is, is good, and it can make a lot of money, but you have to have a market. And I remember going with a guy one day all the way over to west, east of Nevada to deliver hogs. And, you know, that's not good. So I think that we'll have a revitalization of, the, of a lot of farmers that want to get into the hog business because to have this market and the prices that they'll get uh, is very supportive. And we need that in this county. This is an agriculture county. The banks depend, all the banks in the area depend on agriculture. That's where most of your loans are. <clears throat> and with the current environment, Good quality loans are a key. And farmers with this type of a market and eventually cattle, uh, it, it's a wonderful program and I support it 100%. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. And then uh, Beverly Peel. I was just wanting to know how they are going to get these hogs into the plant. Yeah, I think that's a great question that we'll ask. It's one, one that I had too as well, is what's the entrance to the uh, to the main plant? And I think we did have one question of mine that I had, is where is the plant going to be located? And I think uh, Mr. George Slide showed that on that far northeast side yep. of the 46, 47 acres. And then the hogs come in on a truck, as you saw, you can't even tell what's going on because it's built so well. Uh -huh. That truck backs up to and butts up to the building and the hogs go in the building. At no time are there any animals exposed to the outside. So on that, I don't know if we can bring it back up. We can we can all look at it together. Well, will they come in off the highway? Yes, ma'am. 
They come in right in front of KDOT. There's an access road on the north side there. So I wondered what that was built for several mm -hmm. years ago. Yes. Because I just live to the south. Yeah. And, yeah. and the reason we place the plant where we are is to, to be as least of resistance to you as possible. To because you were you were you and the community were at the forefront when we did we did this because it, it's exactly what I've said is we are here. I'm a <laughs> I feel like Michael Jackson. So so we're we're here to um, be only good things to this community. We're trying to bring higher wage jobs. We're trying to bring a food source, a sustained food source. You know, uh, when COVID happened and there was no meat on the shelves, we were the only people in Overland Park that were serving meat out of our little meat, our deal, because we were the ones that make the meat. And we could get the animals. So then we had a beef shortage because the big plants couldn't produce. So me knowing the uh, agriculture producers, I called some guys. Yeah, nobody's bidding our beef in the feedlots. Okay, hang on a second. I called Fort Worth. We started killing beef. We had beef in Kansas City a week later. And those people had a food source because we could put all the dots together. And that's what we have to start thinking of as a nation and these big corporations. Have, and we need them because they, they feed the world. We, the United States feeds the world. And we need them. But the problem is, is when we come into shortfalls, they still have to abide by their contracts to China. And they had to feed China. And then America got what we got and we got short. So people like us came in, and it allowed us to fill a niche. And we took the beef that weren't being bid in the feedlots by whatever uh, beef plant that was bidden at that time. And we were able to take those to a plant like this, have them harvested, and had them delivered into Overland Park. And they were actually going into, believe it or not, Price Chopper and hy vs and everything, anybody that needed beef products to be put on the shelf. And so is what these, these plants give you is when something like that happens, you have a secured local food source. Not only a secured local food source, you have, as long as you have cattle around here and you have pigs around here, you have a food source. And so it, the whole thing we're doing here is trying to, bring the community all the way in on this. It's it's a total community effort. And when we were looking at doing it, John John brought up, hey, let's put this thing 800 feet back off the road um, so that when people are coming into town and everything else, even if the question arises, which it won't, because you won't be able to tell in that building there, you can't tell the difference between it and if we're making boxes or tennis shoes inside of it. And then the second one was, as I brought up, Mrs. Peel's house. Let's keep it back here, and we'll come in off this access road instead of the other access road, and keep it back over here, and 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 so stay out of your hair. And turn like you're going to the state, and there's that. Uh huh. Slab. Yeah, and Next then we'll road. turn left and go back to the plant. Okay. I just was concerned about oh, how you were going to no get problem. on and off and. The odor. No problem. Pretty well covered you live there. You should be concerned. Okay. So we appreciate that and we appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you should have held out with some pretty sauce or something. <laughs> 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 Not getting good to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. That's good. That's good. We know he's everything. Oh, he's got to give it to him. Oh, amen. Just on. Always got some free time. Likes that part. There we go.
I'm uh, Greg Motley. I live at 816 South Crawford. I'm just coming as a private citizen to speak uh, on behalf of this. Um, I just wanted to point out some um, some some mega trends, some high level stuff. I, not, not into the nitty gritty of this project, but um, I grew up in a small town, moved to the city like a lot of kids did. Got an education, got a big city job, and then uh, 12 years ago, I got sick of living in the big city and. Um, I went there for fame and fortune and got neither, and now I've got happiness living in small town America again. But uh, what happened in between was uh, small town America uh, decline began to accelerate. That began in 1941 when the export of federal taxes began to come out of small towns into large cities. It began with the war effort to build ammunition, machinery, tax credits, accelerated depreciation came came into the big cities. So we didn't get big uh, munitions plants and big plants in small town America. Our tax dollars started going to the big city. The other mega trend that happened at the same time was technology in the agricultural community. It took less and less and less and less farmers to farm an acre of ground. And so both of those has conspired to just really uh, damage uh, small town America. And uh, you can see uh, on the first page there, that um, Bourbon County's uh, population in the last column has decreased 3.43% over the last 10 years. Um, the mega trends that I've described are part of that. Uh, and then the other side of that is when there are fewer and fewer people in the county, costs continue to accelerate. The cost of government continues to go up. So that means there are less and less and less of us to, to pay the more and more and more costs. And then, then, then it just spirals. Uh, retired people can't afford to pay the taxes on their home. And so right now, the best dynamic for a person living in this area is to live in Missouri and pay half the real estate taxes and then drive over the state line to Kansas and pay less uh, income tax. And that's what's going on in Bourbon County and in Fort Scott. Um, I leave town a lot of mornings to go to other locations because I'm a regional manager for my, my employer. And on my side of the road, I'm, I can look in my rearview mirror and forward, I'm about the only one on my side of the road. But there are streams of cars coming in from Missouri and from south and from uh, west coming into Fort Scott to work. The daytime population of Fort Scott is between 1,500 and 2,000 higher than the nighttime population. People are not living here. And if you look at this chart and you compare our mill levy uh, to other counties surrounding us, we're the highest. I'm not blaming uh, either current or past county commissioners for that. They're just caught in a mega trend that we need to reverse. Um, there really wasn't anything we could do about these two gigantic mega trends. They just happened to us. Uh, wasn't anything we can do. Now, there are two mega trends that we can take advantage of. Uh, during the pandemic, those large plants in uh, Dodge City and Garden City and Liberal started running at very, very, very low capacity. You know, I don't think that they're coming back. I think that uh, they're going to restrict the capacities permanently of a lot of these facilities, perhaps. And uh, there's a bill before Congress right now to support uh, with uh, tax credits and other incentives the, the uh, construction and proliferation of these micro meat processing plants. Uh, this is part of a mega trend that we can take advantage of. Somebody mentioned they, they, they would hate to see multiple of these in the area. I would love to see multiple of these in the area. As a banker, Steve is right, 70% of the loans that I make go to farmers and ranchers. Take a look at page two. Um, you can see the, the counties in our region and their dependence upon agriculture. If you look at the last column, the value of livestock sold in one year, it's 54 million. If you look at uh, the next column over, the value of crops is about 25 million. That is a very large business in our community. And you look at the number of farms, 813, you know at least one farmer and perhaps his spouse or her spouse and the kids and probably a farmhand or two are working here. That's a lot of employment in Bourbon County. Um, you know, when I was a kid, the farmers and ranchers would come to town and they'd be part of the civic organizations. They'd be on the council. They'd be on planning commission. They'd be uh, just movers and shakers in the town. That's changed. That's, that doesn't happen anymore. 
we don't see a lot of farmers and ranchers, but they come to town. They they shop at uh, Mark McCoy's old place. They shop at Five Corners. They they spend a lot of money in this town. Um, so I just wanted to point out as somebody who's uh, concerned about economics um, that uh, we we uh, embrace agriculture uh, in our communities. Uh, I've heard that kind of the pejorative term slaughterhouse. You know, I um, I I searched slaughterhouse on Google Chrome. The first two hits I got were haunted houses. <laughs> the third one was a um, rock band I'd never heard of. And the fourth one was a movie, Slaughterhouse Five. You know, <laughs> now I'm ignoring the Wikipedia that always gets top billing. But uh, this is a micro meat processing plant. This is going to happen all over the United States. We want it here. We want to be a part of this mega trend. And Steve already mentioned, and, and uh, Billy already mentioned, young people want to know the source of their food. They want to know what row the crop came up, out from. They want to know what farm was it grass fed, where was it processed. They want to know that. That's coming, and uh, this will enable us to compete with those uh, uh, national beefs and the larger processing plants across the United States. So, uh, just as a private citizen, um, I'm I'm fully for this. I, you know, this is uh, farmers and ranchers bring in money from outside the county. If we just trade dollars amongst ourselves, th there's no the boats don't rise. But farmers and ranchers, you know, the vast majority of their money come from outsiders. Uh, they come from large grain companies, large cattle companies. It comes in. That's that's real economic development in our county. Now, as um, I'm uh, also president of Bedco, so if anybody has any questions about how this transaction arose, I'd sure be happy to speak to that. Okay, so I appreciate that. All right. I do want to just kind of remind the public that we're a planning commission, that we're just one say or start this process going with the final say is with the city commissioners. And whatever our decision is today, it'll be brought up to which city commission meetings that set the... Sorry to put you on the spot. March 16th. So March 16th. So whatever we were talking to people behind. <laughs> so whatever we decide to do today, um, the final say with the city commission on the on March 16th. So with that being said, I think we'll uh, kind of let Allie you know, finish uh, up. Rachel? Or do we want Rachel? Okay. And then we'll we'll let the committee ask questions. Okay, I'm the one that gets to follow Greg. Short straw. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, I don't think that really, it'd be a really tough debate for me to stand here and say this wouldn't be good for our community. It certainly would be. Um, is this the good, lo is this the best location for it? And that's kind of what you're tasked with. Uh, last time you met, I did give a few chapters out on the comprehensive plan. And you guys being the Planning Commission know that that's somewhat of the guidance and Bible on how you should promote and or uh, steer clear of development in Fort Scott. So along those lines, it just it speaks to the comprehensive plan and the characteristics of that plan. Also, it so if you go right to Chapter 9, which that's going to give you the most direction, which is land use and growth management. It kicks you back to chapter two, which is the character of the community. And the character of the community is defined by the Planning Commission in the comprehensive plan as clearly we're a history rich community with a strong tie to community benefits such as safety, public education, along the lines, every all the reasons that we all want to live here. Also, uh, the people that make it what it is today. The events and entertainment, and then lastly but not least, is the recreation that's available in our community. And that's what you, the Planning Commission, decided would make up our character. And so that's something that needs to go into consideration when you're talking about promoting development. The thing that I wanted to also bring attention to, which is somewhat buried, and I apologize that it is, but it's in the back of the zoning procedures manual. And this is important, and I think Allie's going to touch on this because she's actually going to really, she's the fortunate one that gets to talk about the specifics of the zoning, is these decisions actually need to be made um, on uh, not the individual project, but 
you are approving the zoning for the whole property. And so it specifically says for all uses permitted uh, and that it should be considered rather than just the one applicant proposal uh, since the ownership could change and or the market conditions could change and that that would be the proposed use of this particular one would be stockyard slash slaughterhouse. Um, you know, certainly recommendations um, on long and short range need, uh, but that they do need to be on the best interests of the community and not just the one particular owner and or the one particular project. And that's the tough call you guys have, and I know you're no strangers to controversy, uh, especially most recently, where, you know, it's kind of, is it a fact or an opinion, and it's, you know, what is what are the facts and how you can best make a fact-based decision. And really, that's our job as the city, to provide those facts to you, to allow you to make the best recommendation um, to, to the city commission, as Mitch stated. So that's my piece on comprehensive plan. I know I gave you guys some reading material last time, but um, I'll, I'll just turn it to Allie to kind of get into the specifics of zoning. All right, so as, as the zoning administrator for the city of Fort Scott, it is my job to just educate you on all that our zoning regulations say on how to make decisions and what all of these things mean. Um, so this is something I read a lot about. You all may not spend as much time reading through your zoning books, and you probably shouldn't. Um, but today, we're talking about a specific issue for a conditional use permit. And I will just level with you. I live on a cattle ranch. So I completely understand the importance of the agricultural industry for our community, for our region. Um, and I'm keenly aware of the negative impacts that COVID-19 has had on the meat processing industry. Um, it's been difficult to get a cow into slaughter over the last year. And a business like this would be phenomenal. Um, the presentation was fantastic. I wholeheartedly believe in this type of business and going this kind of different direction for meat processing. Um, and I don't think there's anybody in this room that's against job growth. Uh, I think we're all for this. But with that being said, I do have hesitations about the specific location of this proposed development because it is at one of our primary entrances to our great community. Um, so again, I would just point out that this property is already zoned industrial two. Um, and what that means for I-2 heavy industry uses tend to be basic or primary industries, which do often produce vibration, smoke, noise, odor, glare, dust, and other effects that will travel off site. And certain obnoxious or hazarded use uses are allowed only upon the issuance of a conditional use permit. So that's why we're here today to discuss that conditional use permit. So we're not really here to approve a site plan or specific renderings or daily operations of a project. We're here to consider the use of this property and not just the use today, but the use long term. What does this facility look like in 25 years, in 50 years? Because 46 acres is quite a large piece of property for future expansion. So those are the, some of the things I would urge you to consider in making your decision on this conditional use permit. And I would remind you that the conditional use permit you would be issuing if this were recommended is for stockyards and slaughterhouses. Um, so I would just urge you to consider what the future of this property could be um, if we move forward on this. So, and I'm certainly here to answer any questions that are pertaining to zoning. Okay, I think we'll, I know we got some questions out here, I'm sure. Uh, I'll be ready for questions and, and answering there. Go ahead. So probably a question for Allie. Yes. Can a conditional use permit be revoked? Um, it certainly can be revoked, though I have to tell you um, from a legal standpoint, I don't really know how that would work. Say we issue this conditional use permit, he gets a couple years down the road, and then we decide, wait a second, 
legally, how do we come in and say, hey, we know you just built a almost $3 million facility, but we would prefer you stop now. I don't know legally that we could have the leeway to go back in a couple years and draw this back. There is potential of setting the conditional use permit for a period of time, say that's a year or two years, but then we do go back to the same problem. In two years, how do we come back and say, eh, never mind? That puts a business person in an awkward situation. Absolutely, it puts all of us in an awkward situation. Yeah. Any questions? Other questions? I had a question on the, the building. Uh, the building that on um, slideshow that you had showed us actually showed, and what I was seeing that the other communities are concrete, large concrete buildings. Mm -hmm. That picture kind of looked like it was metal. It is metal. Okay. It won't because, be concrete. No, because it's uh, it's more aesthetically pleasing. One and number two, the. Uh, panels that that plant's made out of are about five times more energy efficient and cleaner than concrete. So that's how that, when I say this plan is thought through and state of the art and it's, it's, it's what it is. So, um, it's going to be metal on the outside and that's it. No concrete. So, during uh, Mr. George's presentation, he showed where there were some slides and they would open up and have circular uh -huh. fans. Now, uh -huh. is that something that you would consider in this plant? Or it's all going to be self-contained as far as smells and dust and You're always going to have to have some kind of exhaust or, I mean, your house even has exhaust. So, yes, there's, there's exhaust that comes out of the plant because you can't have a zero gravity insider you get people and the hogs and everybody else want to have carbon um, dioxide problems so okay. there's always if I that, so, I if I can carry you. so there's always there's always you always have to exhaust it, whether it's a house or a commercial building or anything else you always have to have makeup air in but it's not like tyson meets exhausting what you see the big stacks coming out and every i mean you see what the plant is, so um, no, in no way is there going to be big exhaust pipes coming out anywhere or anything like that. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, Mr. Madison, you had mentioned that there would be indoor holding pins that would have windows that could be open to allow the air to circulate a little better. Can you give us some That's further right. explanation on that? That's what you saw on John's slide, where you have air curtains that you can pull down. So how are you going to keep the smell? Sorry, I'm not seeing the air curtains. Out into the because there, um, there is no smell because you don't have bacteria. Like when you pass an outdoor hog farm and it stinks, that's because those hogs have defecated and urinated in that ground. And and it just stays in that ground. And with this, the hogs are unloaded on the clean, sanitized concrete. When the day's done, John's, well, throughout the day, John's flush cleans the pens. And then at the end of the day, we clean the pens with 180 degree water to sanitize the concrete. And then we turn around and put an alkaline sanitizer on top of it. And that's per USDA. I mean, that's, you have to, yeah. we have GMP, SOP, um, and then the hogs are only in there for eight hours, eight, nine hours, uh, unless, of course, you have bad weather or something like that, and you can't operate that day. Then they're held 24 hours, but there's no difference because the pens are cleaned while the hogs are in there with John's flush system. So where does that go? That goes into a collection system, into our DAF system, where we collect the proteins. And then we save those proteins and put in our rendering truck to go to Kansas City that we sell. And then once that, that water's cleaned up, it goes to the city sewer for the well pump. So there would be a lift sewer delivering to the local, I mean, a lift pump yes, delivering to the local sewer. Yeah. 
we Which have to. Which is how it. far away? Uh, I believe it's right in front of K Dot. Okay. So about eight hundred feet. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I, you know, hearing this way isn't just perfect. Is okay. So this is now going to be hooked up to the city sewer. That's one thing I guess we wanted. Uh, I wanted at least. Uh, an answer on, I think you did answer the yes, it will be hooked yes. up. There will be no pools or anything to that degree outside. No, no lagoon system. Yes, Carol, that's correct. Okay. He, he originally thought lagoon and then it yeah. went back to yeah. 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 And can you kind of, to and me. It, it wouldn't have been just a lagoon, though. <laughs> it would have been a covered lagoon. Okay. That, uh, so you cover it in this plastic and you can use the methane gas to run your plant. So I could have used that as gas. It, it's a real neat deal you can do now. So the lagoon still wouldn't put off any smell because we'd be capturing the gases off of it. So, And, and the waste coming from the, that, that actually gets flushed through the sewer is probably not that much. The, once you say get everything, one more time. Once you get everything that you take out of the, the waste and the water or the cleaning, and all that it's is it it's reduced it to, it actually will be cleaner than your household waste that you send to the city sewer because yeah. we again we make a living doing this and so those proteins and feces and everything else in the blood has proteins in it and we sell that for money and and that's part of that's part of the being a good business person in the harvest business is you collect everything you can collect. Anything you can sell, you better sell it because if you're throwing it away, you're throwing it away. So. And Michael Mix, so the city engineer, also said that they, they wouldn't notice with the amount of gallons used and the amount of gallons go through the water system, they wouldn't notice any difference in it. They wouldn't even notice they were there. There's no concern. We're also no concern. catching, we're, we're being good stewards of the our natural resources also because like John's system, we're, we're collecting like what at our wash stand where we're where all the hogs are being washed through a cabinet that's being caught and sent to john's john's flush system so it flushes it so we're you doing water reuse everywhere in the plant that we can so that we don't have this huge water expenditure because i mean we obviously need to be good stewards of either one of our lands <laughs> So this is for your one plant, but how many plants could you possibly put on this acreage? Just one other. We would look at uh, doing a non-fed cow and bull plant that also did fats once a week. And will that have outside pens no. on that? It will be indoor also. Okay. And, and the reason the cows can stay outside, pigs can't. But cows can handle being outside, as you know. Uh, Port Scott livestock, most pens are outside, no problem. Uh, but in the plant environment, it's best to have them inside because we can start washing and applying E. coli, um, reducing uh, sanitizers to them. And so you kind of wash those cattle down when they, when they received. And so you keep them all inside. And, and that's to reduce E. coli. You don't want them out in muddy pens and things like that. So for this 45 acres, it can just hold two plants, max? Yeah, there's not going to be... I mean, you can do whatever you want to do. But our vision is what you see here, uh, 17,000 close, and the beef plant will be about the same size. Okay. And then what about the nitrates added to sewer system? Is that any... Concerned. That would nitrates would be on a further processing plant that is pumping hams and bacon and things like that. We have we're total fresh meat. Okay. So nitrates are used to change the hemoglobin color in the meat from red to pink when you cook. Thank you. Okay. The reason I was asking about revoking ever. So I think this all sounds wonderful. I love it. But let's say 20 years from now, Tyson wants to come in and, and buy and do something different on that land. That's, I'm just curious, do we have any 
and maybe there's, I was thinking there's already something in the industrial park about noxious odors and is there already some stipulations you know, not about that, that? Not that I know of, and I guess no, what, I believe what I remember from the Bedco meeting that there's no livestock allowed uh, for a certain amount of time. The covenants actually prevent That's, any outside okay. um, uh, animals. And now, is this, this land part of that, It's though? not technically part of the uh, Bedco, no. It might be something to consider going forward, but at, right at this point, it's privately owned land on um, directly adjacent to. It's two miles outside of town and right on the end and uh -huh. uh, the so is there something that we can write into this to prevent something like that from happening because if we if we label this as slaughterhouse which i know we don't really it's, consider this right. in the same alley how you know what i'm saying just in the future if something were to change is there anything we can do to prevent that i am not sure how we could further clarify simply because this Conditional use would allow for stockyard and slaughterhouse. So I'm not sure what clarifier we could put in there to prevent Tyson from coming in and or anyone from coming in later and purchasing this property. And as long as they stick within that conditional use. I could maybe give you some expert advice. I, I, I don't know. Your number one problem is it's not big enough for Tyson. The land is not big enough. John, do you agree? Yeah. Uh, when you when you go to building that wouldn't even that would barely cover the parking lot for the employees. These plants are big. They kill three thousand animals a day, upwards sometimes to five thousand on the beef side. On the hog side, the biggest one, Smithfield, kills 30,000. It's 192 acres under roof, not counting the parking lot or holding pens. If that gives you a, what what everybody thinks is not what this is. This that, is a small, okay. small deal. And, yeah. and that 46 acres is not big enough for any big company to come in and want it. Even if it wasn't a big company, though, could somebody could a though small company have a and 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 at some point put in holding pins outside that would cause smell? Would you? You wouldn't. The whole thing revolves around the reason the pins are inside is because of stress level. So I'm going to get a little fancy on you here. So if I receive my pigs at three o'clock in the morning, that's usually when they come in because they need to set a minimum of three hours to let the lactic acid get out of their body, just like if you went through a workout. If that does not happen, we get into problems like PSE and blood splashing in the meat. And so we have to let those hogs rest three hours from the, from the truck ride. If it's winter time, a hog's skin's like our skin. We can't have them out in negative 20 degree weather for four hours. That's why the pins are inside is so no, any company that is thinking they're going to operate that's going to kill hogs on this level. This is a whole nother level. This isn't I'm selling this meat back to you. And so we can have marginal things. We're selling to Whole Foods and Sprouts and people who care about the quality of the meat. And so therefore you can't you can't keep them outside because you'll have quality issues. The whole, everything, every bad thing that people come up with, it all reverts back to regu the regulations are already there. The USDA, uh, they do outside perimeter checks. We, uh, I mean, we have humane handling papers. We have a humane handling guy that comes around once a year. And if you have problems, then they're going to be there more often. We have our in-plant inspector, which we'll probably end up with two. Then you have their boss and their boss's boss and their boss's boss. And that's not a joke. There's sometimes there's more inspectors in an area than there is people you hire. And it's because we're keeping our food safe. It's, it's a serious job. And uh, so any of those things, they, they are demanded to report back. If, if we have an offensive problem that we're creating, they have to call the EPA. If we do something here, and even though it's not under their jurisdiction, they have to make contact with another federal agency to get it under control. 
And so everything is checked and cross-checked with these neat plants. And, and, and just by bad media and everything else, they've gotten a, gotten a black eye. So, but this is a totally separate thing. We're, we're talking about a little family-owned meat processing plant. I mean, you can look on our documents of incorporation. It's my wife. I don't have any questions. I mean, I, and, I, and I, I'm not being personal. Looks. I'm just saying. No, yeah. You know, yeah. in no way will we ever do anything. I, I am rolling two decades of earned money to do this project. And to bring it to this town. Two decades. We started out at 10 head a week. 10 head a week. You know how much work that was to get to where we are today? You think I'm going to do something that I think is going to get me kicked out of town? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about the people after you. Yeah. Well, hopefully I live to 90. You know? <laughs> but if... If... The thing of Tyson, no, they're not going to come in there because it's too little. Okay. Not even their game. Can somebody else come in and, and do it? Yeah, if they run a terrible shop, but you have the option to send them out of town with a conditional use, use permit. Well, they, that's what she's concerned about is that if they get this conditional use permit now, then somebody else could, like, say he decided to sell somebody or, mm -hmm. or something happened. So the thing is, is that they'll have the same regulations that Billy has today, and so yeah. they'll still be highly regulated regardless yeah. if it's Billy or another owner that's and, there. And you got to think, if, if I go to sell this property, it's not going to be cheap. So somebody's not going to do something to waste, to lose their money. So, and FSIC, and you go through and see what the consequences are. It's, it's very up, up front. First, you get a, a warning, and then ultimately, you lose your license. You can't, yeah. you can't work, you can't operate. Just like if you buy bad livestock, if I, if I buy livestock and it tests hot for antibiotics, um, you, you, the third time you're done buying livestock, you're done, and, and that can be. I mean, I'm just buying from a certain supplier. And they test hot for antibiotics. It's 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 on me, not the not the farmer. So we have to. Uh, that's the other part. Yeah, you just got to be. You got to know what you're doing in this business. It's not for the. It's not for the under educated. Um, it it takes a lot. There's a lot of rules, and I mean we operate by a book that's that thick, and. When they come to you, you better know what regulation you're dealing with. So, Billy, you're not closing your plan of this. You're you're moving and making another plant. Correct? I'm moving and making another plant. We're bringing that business with it, and we're selling that plant back to like a custom processor. I see. And, and it, does this come as a cost to the city for the sewer and things of that nature? Uh, as of right now, I'm the one paying for the lift pump and the running the sewer and the water to it. Well, I know if, I know you know. I mean, we're all concerned about the, the road complex and, uh -huh. you know, tourism is, is yeah. what I do. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I'm very excited for this mm -hmm. kind of a business, but I also have to make sure that we still yeah. have that complex and other yeah. room for growth for yeah. it as well. Um. My son plays ball at the Ro Roach Complex. We do business with E3 Meats. Um, we, uh, I'm good acquaintances with Adam. We market their meat through our store in Overland Park. Uh, the man statue that's out front of the La Roach Pro Complex was my baseball coach. So it'd be kind of weird if I did something to affect that. Or something that I know would affect that. Because it is a very nice stadium. The high school kids that get to play there won't see that kind of stadium until they play professional baseball, not even minor leagues. That's a nice stadium. We we have full respect for that stadium. And, and no way do I think anything we are doing here will affect it at all. I I think after we're open, everybody will see It'll just be, you passed by it and you didn't even know what it was. So, but. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Worst case scenario, I own land across the railway track directly to your east. Suppose okay. there's an accident, there is leafage and contamination, mm -hmm. and it ends up over on my land. Where would that lead me? Okay. Where would the leakage come from? From the plant. There's nothing. Downhill. There's nothing to leak because everything's self contained. Like a truck that you're loading dry products in to haul, mm -hmm. don't they leave? No. You Ever? Would, you would I be said first case of you would be, yeah, that. Yeah. You would be in serious trouble. They would be in serious trouble with EPA if they leaked. The DOT and EPA. Yeah, I've had few leaks, but I know what you're going to say. Yeah. You know, like if a hose busted or a tank fell off or something like that. There would be. So, so is what happens with the byproducts. So on the back side of the plant, if we can see the top. View. Um. Are we are we there that yet? One right this there. one. Okay. Okay. So, unfortunately, all these new high class architects do renderings. They don't have a picture of one of these, so we weren't able to do it exactly right. But I wanted to leave it open just in case one of the, a question came up like this. So see the semi on the back side of the plant? Yes. So what will happen is there will be this auger arm that goes out over the top of that trailer. And that's what takes the byproducts to it. So that will be a concrete pad. And that will be have an overhang over the top of it. So you won't even see it because it will be indoors. And so that concrete pad has a drain in the bottom of it which in case we spill in there our rendering that we want to make money on, goes through our sewer system, back through our DAP, and we make the money on that and don't lose it. So, so that would be the only thing that maybe would is, could ever do that, but it's already walled up by concrete, and uh, I don't see how it could ever leak out. Now, could the truck pull out and somehow tip over? I don't know. I don't think so. So, I mean, I just, <coughs> I want you to feel uh, feel safe, and there's just no way that's ever going to happen. There's no way. Number two, if it, if it tipped over, there wouldn't be any blood or anything outside. Is all to be would be some kind of meat scraps because we we save all the blood. We sell that to our Asian markets. So we we capture all the blood inside the plant for edible use. So there would if the truck did tip over, there'd be meat scraps and things like that that could be picked up and dealt with really relatively easily. Nothing's gonna leak into the ground. You want to talk about it? The site actually has what for many applications we call secondary containment. Okay. If you go back to the here, site, come up here, Tom. back to the uh, site, uh, pictures, aerial photo of the front. Now uh, you're going backwards. Go the other way. That one. See that dark star to the right? That's a pond. The immediate proximity of the plant drains to that pond. So it's essentially a catch basin for any spill that occurred at the plant. So it's, it's protected. That one. Yeah. Doesn't look like it anyway. It doesn't look like it's a green bit. Uh, the farmers around here, it takes a while. It's going to have pressure. And, and we already have, we have hog farmers in Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, Missouri. And the farthest away we've gotten hogs is uh, Colorado. So it um, we, we deal with hogs from all those states. And we also have the infrastructure too. So while say, hey, you come to me, hey Billy, I want to I want to sell the Whole Foods, and I want to do it under my my brand. 
I can I can make your brand and you can buy our pork from us and we can we can market that for you until you get your herd built up. Or if you wanted to do an exploratory process and say, man, I think I might be able to do this, but I don't want to go spend all the money to do everything. But I think I have the sales, the sales that I can sell this over here. Well, we can sell you our pork to your niche needs. Custom label it. You go and sell it. You create your market, and then you can create your hog farm. So... Yeah. I have a question. Um, my name is Ann Dare. I live at 918 Paris. Um, back to the amount of hogs you said 500 a day? We'll start at 250. Okay, whatever that uh -huh. is. 500, you know. Yes, ma'am. What, what does that look like in trucks? One. Really? 500 a day? Two. 250 a day. 250 oh, so a day is one. Two trucks a day. Two trucks. Coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good question. And the reason we bring them at three o'clock in the morning is they need, in the summertime, they need cooled and they are less stressed in the dark than they are in the light. Okay. One question I have, uh, Billy, is the, uh, the noise factor. Uh -huh. I know I'm uh, pretty limited. So I have, uh, we should have brought a overhead of, of the plant now. We unload semis at the Spring Hill plant and there's a house property 20 feet behind our hog barn and we unload it to 3 a.m. 4 a.m. and nobody in fact they sent us a letter of recommendation so your plant now up in spring hill is in a residential area and a commercial area what it's a weird <laughs> it's what you guys are talking about not wanting to get into you got uh i have five hundred thousand dollar houses you can see from our plant i have a $130,000 house on each side of me. And then after the house on the north, it turns into commercial, uh, Dan's Truck and Trailer Service, TSA, uh, up through there. And then the industrial park on the other side. And then on the other side of the tracks is more housing. So it's just kind of a hodgepodge right there in that area. And then the co-op's kind of the diagonal from us. Any other? Questions? I have one clarification. I mean, I think uh, the conditional use is basically attached to the property and not the business itself. Correct? That's correct. So, yeah. Um, is it conditional use or special? This is a conditional use. use. So if you have conditional use, then you should be able to add the condition. Mm -hmm. That might uh, suffice your concerns over there. Correct. That's what I was going to say. Couldn't you add in no outside view? Yeah. And that's pretty simple. It's kind of my that, thoughts on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's totally doable. Because of our great farm here, when we go to do the cow slaughter plant, it'll actually make it to where we don't have to have as many pins because I have my Uncle Frank north of town. We have other family and other friends where we can stage the Cadillac and bring them in by the truckload as we need them to the plant and we don't have to have this big expanse holding pin inside so it actually is uh is a good thing so on that picture there is that plant north of that pond that's uh that's k dots that's k dots barn yeah but i mean the you see the, the star pond right there yeah, yeah. Where, where is the plant to the left of it to the left okay just yeah. basically do south of that. Yeah. Okay. And, and right there where that first entrance is, is going to be your entrance way. No way you're going to use the old highway yeah. part that was. And that, that entrance road is better than what this map's showing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a nice asphalt drive to the fence line now. If, if I go to the other picture with the plant on it, there, you this can one? see the end of the access road. The it's the in end. those white and lines. Okay, yeah. It turns right after you come off of 69. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, get I believe the pond is down in here. Any other questions? Can you generate any sales tax? Uh, we can't because of the. Uh, 
number one, I think in the industrial park you can have retail, and two, our, uh, what's that? Evergy. Through Evergy, our deal, we can't have a retail location. So if you do B, what are you thinking, just saying, down the road? How much would you do a day? 130. 130? To start. That's a, you always start out at, at your best. So that's a semi load out with a semi load and a half in. Just because of the price structure, you know, you don't want to send out a half full truck. And then you mentioned local farmers mm -hmm. that you might buy from them at some time. Is that? Oh, we will buy from local farmers. That's, that's the whole gist of this is. We have created the poultry demand for the poultry, and we have developed the markets. So, to our commodity markets, we can get rid of the offalls that cost you money as a small producer because you can't do anything with it. I've created those markets so I can sell the stomach, the blood, the intestines, everything, heads, tongues. Right. So. I, I've created that market, so is what's going to happen. You bring me 10 pigs, and instead of paying 50 bucks to get rid of the offal, we've turned that into money that can go towards your processing fee, and then you can go sell your meat when you don't have as much cumbersome cost. So they wouldn't have to have the 500 hogs for you to... No, no, so, not at all. Well, that's good to know. And 500 is the top. I, I right. hope everybody understands that. But we went with the top number. We're starting at 250. Yeah. All right. Anticipated water use. I knew somebody was going to ask that, and I forgot to look. It's like 12 to 13,000. It's 100. It basically, it's 150 gallons per hog a uh, uh, kill shift. So. 150 times 250. You want me to do that? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no concerns about water no, usage as well. In fact, Mr. Mix, when we met that day, was uh, um, said, that's all. So he said he could provide a lot more than that. <clears throat> Any other questions? You like anybody like to make a motion? Yeah, she submitted. Huh? Oh, I do. Sorry. In. Yes, thank you. Uh, one question is how can the city absorb the extra waste where it can't handle the human waste we have now uh, on there? Which I think part of that is it's being reduced from your standpoint. Um, your sewer system can't handle the waste. I don't know that we have any issues with the industrial park. Uh, our, my business is out there, and I don't know that we have it or we're at it. Again, Mr. Mix thought he didn't have an okay. issue. Well, um, if I could just add to that, I, I asked that question. So currently, we can um, handle, currently, we're on average 100,000, um, or excuse me, a million gallons. So the plant can handle up to 5 million. So, mm -hmm. so you're okay. Yeah. And then the other one is, do I sell the 46 acres to employ 30 people, save the bigger piece of land for someone who will bring bigger changes to our area? Uh, we have any uh, opportunities in any bigger areas, options for that area? It's privately owned property. Yeah. So. And it's been empty for a long time. Yeah. About ten thousand years. <laughs> so does anybody? I don't believe I can make a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we uh, accept the conditional use permit uh, to be assigned for this piece of property. We make a recommendation. Recommendation. I'm sorry. Okay. Did, did you want to say the rest of that for me? <clears throat> uh, it, I, I was going to be sarcastic, but I won't. Um, should you want me to rephrase that? No, you're good. Okay. The recommendation of basically accepting it 
a conditional use for that piece of property. And that that's it for that 46, 47 acres. Yeah, as it states here in number 26 to be allowed in that, uh, in that function. <clears throat> if, the, it w if it was the flavor of the group, we could remove the words stockyard and just, I'm sorry, and just indicate slaughterhouse. I, I believe that uh, legal counsel uh, could provide some texture on that because I think the uh, um, uh, lawyers are really good at writing things and they could have addendums to, to, to uh, issues or concerns or to policies. And uh, if it was a concern, that's something that should be addressed by the city commissioners uh, if this does uh, go before a vote here and it does pass here, that the city commissioners would have the right to augment that. Were you making a motion, sir? Did I not? Did I, <laughs> finish it for me. You, you've now I think I can. Do we have a second? That, that's in the form of a motion, whatever I said. Okay. <laughs> we got the gist. How's that? Second that. So discussion, do we, in, in my thoughts, do we want to put anything I, on there? Yeah, if stipulate? I could make an amendment to Absolutely. the motion that we include the condition that there be no outside pens allowed on the property. You'd be okay with that. Yeah. And again, not for you, but for... Yeah. The future. So, yeah. we, so the the motion's amended to basically go ahead and approve it for conditional use with no outside pins. Located That's exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other additions or subtractions, Darcy? Before I so walk out I, of the room. Do we have a second on that? Well, I can't say that. Okay. okay. That's okay. Mark McCoy. Discussion. <laughs> Call vote. Cheryl Allison. Yes. Jeff Clark. Yes. Pam Hightower. Yes. Denise Friesick. Yes. Mark McCoy. Yes. Carol MacArthur. Yes. Darcy Smith. Yes. Judy Warren. Yes. Bushwick. Yes. All right. I'm going to make a motion to. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. So aye. <laughs> all opposed. Thank you. Yes, you do.